Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is Patricia from the International Hospital Federation. Thank you very much for joining us today, and I hope you're all safe and well. We at the IHF are hosting this COVID-19 webinar and live Q&A series to share experiences, good practices, and insights from our members and other organizations across the globe. The series has been created with healthcare providers for healthcare providers, including decision makers and those involved in preparing for and managing COVID-19. We hope the lessons you take away from this webinar will help you in facing the crisis. I would now like to introduce the moderator of this webinar, IHF CEO, Eric Terudenbeck. Eric? Yeah, thank you very much, Patricia, and uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome you to this uh, webinar. So as uh, it was mentioned with this series of webinar, we wanted to be able to share experiences from various parts of the world with different level of preparedness, but also different level of capacities in the hospitals. Today, we will go to Georgia, a country at the crossroads between Europe and Asia. This country did not face a, a major load of cases and is at a stage where the epidemic curve has been flattened, like now most of the countries in current days. Uh, but what uh, will be particularly interesting is that we'll have the experience from the private sector, as in Georgia, the private sector is a major player for health service delivery with a private group that is present in the whole country and plays a major role in providing health care to the population. So this presentation will allow us to better understand uh, the role of the private sector but also how a group of hospital that is covering a whole country is mobilizing itself to respond to a situation of crisis like this uh, pandemic. Let me uh, introduce you the speaker for today. It's a, a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Mamuka Skedje, and I will call him Professor Mamuka, the deputy CEO uh, for the medical cooperation edx hospital in in georgia so this position has been uh, in the hands of uh, professor mamuka since 2019 he's uh, uh, since 2017 the president of the georgian society of anesthesiology and critical care medicine he's associate professor in the uh, tsu uh, a medical director of CME Center and Center of European Education in Anesthesia. Before he was a CEO at Joan Medical Center in Tbilisi, the capital city from Georgia, and prior to that, director of intensive care department uh, in pediatric and adult. He also worked at the Central Children Hospital Republic, and uh, that sounds very much as a Soviet Union time, Republic Hospital, and uh, in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. So Professor Mamuka is uh, a, a MD in pediatrics and uh, has a PhD in medical science from Tbilisi State Medical University. Professor Mamuka, we are ready to hear about the experience in your country. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Rodenbeck, thank you, Patricia. Thank you, all attenders. Mm, uh, and um, now I'll share my presentation and we'll start. Well, a uh, couple words about Georgia. Georgia is uh, located in Caucasus region, Southern Caucasus. And the population is almost 4 million. And it spreads from Black Sea to Caspian Sea. It's about Georgia. Uh, uh, and uh, in this presentation, I'll briefly uh, present uh, and tell you about our experience and challenges we met during COVID outbreak in Georgia. Uh, as you hear, my name is Mamu uh, and I'm deputy CEO clinical at, at medical uh, corporation AVEX hospitals. Uh, very shortly about our medical corporation, it's a private corporation. 
and we have 18 hospitals all over the Georgia. We have almost 9,000 employees at all, and more than 3,000 doctors, physicians, and a bit more than 3,000 nurses. In uh, 2019, we have admission of uh, 326,000 uh, uh, patients, inpatients, and almost 600,000 outpatient admissions. This is the map of uh, Georgia. And there are, you can see uh, our hospitals in uh, seven different regions of Georgia. So I can say that we are biggest medical corporation in Georgia, and maybe we are one of the biggest uh, medical corporations in our region. Well, about our response. At the beginning, almost two, two months ago, as COVID, infect, COVID uh, infection reached uh, Georgia, uh, we, we made uh, immediate response action plan. And there are four main pillars of our response. We have created new structure, a new strategy, that means action plan. So 30 different algorithms, protocols, and recommendations has been done by our team. I mean, uh, AOS Hospital's uh, head office clinical team. So we started TOT, training of trainers of hospitals, and also we created emergency response plans. So I'll go ahead about uh, response structure, action plan, trainings, and monitoring. Uh, we have established dedicated epidemiology and clinical team, uh, consisted of our uh, members of our head office clinical team, seven members, they are clinical specialists, they are epidemiologists and medical quality specialists and 24 to 7 accessibility. Uh, as I said previously, we have, we have created 30 different main documents, regulations, recommendations, algorithms and so on. And we started immediate online and offline trainings of TOTs in 18 hospitals. Uh, we have chosen 18 responsible persons, 48 TO2 trainers, and 54 support trainers. Uh, so finally, as a result, we have trained, and by the way, we are continuing this training daily, in the daily basis, more than 2,200 nurses and more than 2,400 doctors in ER, ICU, therapy, in the key, key zones of our hospitals. Also, we have trained 800 administrative staff and more than 100, uh, 100, uh, 1,100 supportive staff. At the same time, we have started monitoring of the hospitals, how our trained persons are continuing their trainings. So in this, in these tasks, we have got assistance of our risks departments, audit and clinical boards. We have clinical boards in our head office. Clinical boards consist of uh, experts of their clinical specialties in our networks, network in our hospitals. So, and we started weekly on-site monitoring of hospitals. Uh, and also we have done four to or five scenarios of simulations per day. Uh, also, we started working on general awareness. And you can see these uh, posters and uh, pictures that are put it all, all over the walls, on over the, the spaces of hospitals. This is educational posters. This is online campaigns, video calls, uh, internal campaign, together we can fight coronavirus like, like this uh, uh, scenarios, stickers in elevators, protecting wall, 
for registration desks to avoid this aerosol uh, spreading for the registration uh, personnel. And also very important issue was self and active monitoring of personnel. It means thermal screening, respiratory sign checking. And so there is, these data are putting on application by employees, by our personnel, and is also on the control of HRs and uh, administrative uh, persons. This is also examples of our work, how we work on general awareness. Uh, this is the part of online and internal campaigns, posters, and so also very important thing at the beginning, we have stopped all visitors on the hospitals and instead of uh, direct visiting and uh, direct visits, we have established um, uh, so-called video, video uh, visiting using iPads and, and other uh, devices. So um, they, the patients and the visitors can communicate using these devices, which is very important to, to control the, the infection uh, in, inside of the hospitals. Well, then uh, it's um, one of the uh, very important steps has been done by our uh, team at the beginning. This is a safe patient journey. Safe patient journey consists of um, three main steps, three main issues. Pre-triage infrastructure, and I'll show you this infrastructure in next, in next uh, slide. Training of the hospital staff by head office epidemiology and clinical team, and the QO team, pre-triage officer, triage nurse, ER nurses, doctors, clinical director, and quality director in the hospital. This is simplified uh, chart of, uh, pre, of pre-triage system. It costs, it, this is the product of four different, uh, more complicated, sophisticated charts. But just for, for uh, to give you a sense, what I mean about the pre-triage uh, chart, this is here we are. So pre-triage, aim of pre-triage is early recognition of COVID suspect patient and isolation from other patient and personnel. Uh, location of pre-triage is in front of entrance or at the entrance of hospital space. So the pre-triage officer usually nurse Next, thermal screening, clinical assessment, fever, respiratory signs, etc., and positive epidemiological history, traveling contacts, clusters, and etc. And you can see that if the question one and two, or only one question on clinical signs, are yes, we are we put this patient in isolation uh, space in ER using PPE, usual PPE, then a real uh, triage is made. And if patient is in emergency medical condition, we treat it as indicated. If no emergency medical condition, we activating NCDC service, um, testing uh, and the referral for, to COVID or, or fever hospitals. If uh, the only positive epidemiologic history is positive. We advise this um, person self-isolation and also we activating in CDC services. And if no, no signs of uh, COVID infection and no epidemiologic history, so we manage this patient according to our indications. I, I, I'd like to uh, repeat that it's a simplified chart, simplified triage structure. Uh, another very important issue also we have done, one of the very important issues is the part of new strategy is the TOT or training of trainers according to right and correct using of PP, personal protective equipment. Uh, it, from uh, head office clinical department, we have prepared recommendations for correct usage of PPE, or when and what, dunning and duffing, aerosol uh, generating procedures and non-AGPs, etc. Uh, 
then we have trained also trainers in hospital staff how to use correctly PPE and also we have created PPE strategy for hospitals. This is, uh, from my point of view, is one of the very interesting issues. So I'll focus a couple minutes around this uh, strategy. So we have established local PPE teams in each hospital. These teams consist of leader that has been chosen by the CEO of hospital and team members. And they have three main functions. Local PP team main functions are monitoring of training process. Uh, as I said, this training process is in the daily basis. And also we do external monitoring from, from the headquarter, head office. Second is control and the monitoring of training performance. And also we have, we do external monitoring. And third one is PPE spending control. And also in this, in this situation, if some conflict appears inside of the hospital between personnel and PPE spending control person, we make, we make uh, audit and uh, we try to manage this conflict just to avoid overusing on, or incorrect using of PPE from uh, hospital personnel. Um, new strategy also um, means new clinical management protocols. Uh, I, I focused on two main uh, clinical management protocols. Um, this is pneumonia register, so-called new protocol. We have we daily monitoring of patients with severe bilateral peripheral GGO of pneumonia to detect potentially missed COVID infected cases because we know in some cases the PCR or other tests might be negative, but patient can be infected by COVID. So, so this is very important issue. And we, we use this register to, to, to detect potentially missed COVID infection cases. And how we manage this uh, sort of patients, isolation, treatment, diagnostic in, in investigations to exclude COVID exposure infection. Also, another register, which is very important, is high-risk patient register. So that means daily monitoring of isolated, probable, or suspect COVID on non-pneumonic patients, clinical assessment, diagnostic, and laboratory assays, CT, X-ray, etc. Uh, also, from clinical management point of view, uh, very important is to prepare and, pre and preparedness of ICU spaces for COVID patients. Safe and remote airway management devices like glidoscopes, closed suction systems, HEPA filters for ventilators. Ventilators and critical equipment has been renewed. And also um, uh, we concentrated on right and correct use of PPE and the, the, the PP correct using. I mean, isolation in case of COVID 19 confirmed. So, in case we have got a patient or personnel inside the, in, in the hospital with, with the COVID infection, uh, we started trainings of personnel, the treatment and supportive care of COVID patients, safe air management, prompt positioning for severe pneumonia patients, diagnostic and laboratory tools, etc. And the safety trainings. Once again, PPE isolation, safe airway management, AGP safe protocol, hand hygiene, and etc. Uh, also, we have contact identification policies 
isolation itself, self-isolation policies, protocols, NCDC service activation, pathways, tests, referral, etc. Uh, one more issue we have we have put, put in the new strategies uh, staff infection and business interruption risks so-called emergency replacement teams uh, we have limited the risk of active medical staff immediate paid vacation option for employees over 70 by the way, it has been declined by most of employees. Same offshore from employees over 65 under 70 subjects to hospital director approval. And we have changed a to 16 hour shifts to 24 hour shifts to decrease, to decrease risk of infection spread between different shifts. And also very, uh, very strict restrictions of movement between hospital departments. From administrative staff point of view, we have changed two two weeks shifts where possible, achieved at least partially in most hospitals. In head office, successfully implemented remote working mode with sufficient coverage of rising risks. Uh, also, positions critical for continuous operation where identified and replacement plan was uh, devised and uh, which that is very important we have created uh, so-called re reserves of critical critical uh, specialties critical personnel so we have identified identified the uh, critical departments continued the operation of which is of most importance like er icu surgery uh, or identification of required reserve size in case of infection spread in two hospital department at once, and analysis of existing human resources in these de departments, we like to decrease demand to identify existing reserve potentials. So finally, we have what so-called bank of employees, bank of personnel, that, that is maybe not too much, but for our network is very important. So we have got 28 ERs the positions, 21 ICU positions, including pediatric and neonatal ICUs, and 10 therapy, internal medicine doctors, uh, 59 nurses was created using our own employees. And this also includes junior, uh, good experience, junior doctors and, and the residents of second and third degree. Um, and this, in case of existing infection disease hospitals in the, the the Georgia uh, hospital beds are not enough. We have plans plan how to change profile of some of our um, general hospitals to COVID infection hospitals. Nowadays, we have uh, changed the profile of two hospitals. One of them became fever hospital in Poti. This is the Black Sea side uh, city. And also, we have one COVID infection uh, hospital in Kutaisi. Kutaisi is the second biggest city in Georgia. It's located in Western Georgia, in the heart of Western Georgia. Yeah. And uh, we have the strong agreement with Ministry of Health uh, and government of Georgia. If the number of occupied infected beds reach some certain points, we have to, re, uh, to change the profile of three more big referral hospitals, including two of them in Tbilisi. So um, we have this schedule and we have exact hospitals and we have medical personnel of these hospitals retrained for COVID infection hospital um, rules and aims. And of course, most, most important issue is uh, personal safety, PP again and so on. Um, and also determining expected PP requirements 
because partially it, it will be covered by government and also purchasing additional requ required equipment as i said previously to keep icus in a good uh, good shape in good preparedness or in, in case of infection uh, covid infection appears also safe cleaning protocols catering uh, in the implement to be safe catering implementation and so um, and also plan of safe discharge and transfer of existing hospitals to be prepared for COVID hospitals. Uh, th that is all our strategy as steps done by uh, AVEX hospitals in, to meet the, all, all these challenges COVID brought in Georgia. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Mamuka. And um, that was a very interesting overview. Uh, perhaps while waiting for potential questions, uh, I would like to ask you uh, one related uh, between the public and the private sector, because what is very unique is, as you said, uh, EVEX Group is the largest uh, private provider in the whole country. So for all these organizations that you have put in place, uh, uh, the identification of the hospitals that could be the one that, and that have been mobilized because you had COVID patients to treat, uh, or that could be the one further mobilized. Uh, how did you work with the pri public sector? Did you have to wait for them to tell you uh, what you could be doing, or did you take the initiative? Did you just coordinate, or you had to collaborate? Can you tell us a little more how it worked? Well, okay, this is combination of all issues we have just you mentioned. First of all, all this strategy is our, our own initiative done by Avex Hospital Head Office Clinical Team. All this preparedness and all these steps. But we have very good collaboration and cooperation with Ministry of Health. First of all, uh, it is very interesting that in Georgia, Almost, almost 100 percent of medical cases, expenses, I mean, are covered by government. So we we have to be cooperative with government, with Ministry of Health, because the, all all our uh, um, uh, revenue is coming from from the uh, budget from the uh, government. So the, this is very good uh, synthesis of cooperation between uh, uh, Ministry of Health and Government, state, I mean, and private, private corporations and private hospitals. And by the way, Georgia, almost 95% almost of all hospitals are private, more or less. Uh, so uh, cooperation, between our corporation and other private hospitals and government is very important because the, in case if state hospitals beds and um, uh, capacity of state hospitals are not enough to cover all the uh, whole needs of to treat COVID patients, we have agreement as I said previously, to change profiles of our hospitals. And nowadays we have one fever hospital and one COVID infection hospital. And also we have a reserve of three more big hospitals in case of increasing the number of infected patients. We are ready to, to change the profile of these hospitals and also make them as a COVID hospital. This is agreement between government and uh, our uh, corporation. And also very important, in this case, government takes all, all the responsibility to obtain these hospitals totally by PPE. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so, so, but still, I mean, for example, as you said, that was the initiative from EVEX Corporation to develop the protocols, the plan, the organization. Yeah. Does it mean that uh, within Georgia, the public hospitals or the other private hospital have developed their own plans that might have been different or they may have uh, different protocols? Isn't no. Is there a unique uh, health agency that at the end of the day is making sure that uh, everything is aligned or not? No, of course. We have NCDC, we have system of healthcare, and they give us recommendations, general recommendations, of course. Yes, of course. And we are, we are working according to these recommendations and our our strategy and our protocols are in, in cooperation and in, in a synchronization with the NCDC and Ministry of Health recommendations, protocols, and etc. But we have, you know, this is general recommendations from NCDC, but we we also make very exact and very uh, how to say very detailed detailed sub protocols and uh, algorithms for our uh, hospitals to make sure that they they are making a, a, this safety protocols done by ncdc in the proper way and also we have some more details uh, that we consider is very important for our hospitals because we know the problems we know advantages and problems of our hospitals better than the government for instance ministry of health you understand yes thank you very much so let's go to the questions i've received so question about did you have anyone among your staff that has been covid positive and if it's the case how did you manage that and the second question related to the staff that might be linked to this one is did, did you have any special arrangement like bonuses or, or anything because you had the staff that has to change the shift, you know, and the, the, the workload? Yes, of course. We have a bonus system and we have increased the salary of our critical specialties like ER, ICU, nurses, uh, we increase their salaries and we hope we have also bonus systems right now we are working about how to how to share this uh, information that now is the time we are giving bonuses to our employees by the way it's a very interesting point and uh, regarding first question uh, covid positive patients yes, yes fortunately we have no covid positive uh, uh, person in our in, in the hospitals. We have several suspect patients and they, we put them in self-isolation and uh, by NCDC PCR test has done twice according to the protocol. So fortunately we have no infected personnel. Okay, so that's good news and that's uh, very good for your hospital. Yeah, you, mentioned also, you, you mentioned also that you, you, know, you did uh, reduce all possible you know, patient flow. Does it mean that you had been uh, postponing elective surgery and perhaps your part of your operating rooms uh, in uh, less uh, in action than in it should have been so that you can prepare uh, and have a potential extra resources? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, at the beginning, the government, as I said uh, previously, government, the main, main um, partner of our corporation is the government. All medical cases, all surgeries are the, the, the expenses regarding the surgeries and the medical cases are covered by government, by budget. So at the beginning, it was some stunning of this process. And of course, admission in, pain, in the planned surgeries decreased dramatically at the beginning. Also, there was a fears in hospitals and they tried to avoid patients with, for instance, fever and 
acute abdomen, they, 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 they try to, to avoid this patient, to reject this patient. Yeah. It happened at the beginning. Nowadays, as we have a very good system of uh, patient flows and safety flow uh, journey of patient, we are ready and we doing all planned or urgent surgeries and all uh, emergency medical conditions are treated by our hospitals and nowadays the revenues and admissions are increasing step by step because the, the hospitals and personnel, uh, how to say, they, they quit these fears and now they are starting work at usual uh, schedule and usual rate. But of course, we consider every single patient as a suspect COVID patient and PPE is used according to the COVID patient safety uh, PPE use. Okay. Talking about the way you, know, you deal with the, the patients, how strong and well coordinated is the relation with primary healthcare center? And uh, how have you been involved in ambulatory and home care uh, follow-up treatments? Relations between clinics, hospitals of EVEX Hospital Corporation, Medical Corporation, and the primary uh, healthcare system is is in a pretty good condition. We have good relations, and we're getting the patients uh, has been sent by these uh, facilities. And uh, regarding uh, home care, uh, we have no practice of home, home care um, patients with COVID infection. All COVID infection, infected patients are in infection hospitals. All suspect patients go to the fewer hospitals uh, and uh, waiting for test results. So we have no, no wide practice of home care system. As I understand your question correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, if you don't have practice, you cannot tell us how you are you are you are doing it. About uh, you really insisted quite a lot on the whole protocol for uh, protective equipment. So did you have to face a shortage? Is this equipment uh, produced in your home country in Georgia, or did you have to import it? Uh, how did you manage? Because that's often a, it's a a, a, a big bottleneck in many countries. Uh, well, you know, Georgia is not producing any equipment uh, like devices, uh, monitors, or ventilators, and etc. But um, uh, but we start government started and also Evex hospitals starting started producing some PPE equipment like uh, uh, surgical masks like combinisons, like uh, other uh, PPE uh, items, but not uh, sophisticated uh, devices. But we are not in short of. As I said in my presentation, I show you in my presentation, at the beginning, the part of our strategy was to renew um, uh, all equipment, uh, and especially critical equipment like ventilators, non-invasive ventilators, monitors, suction devices, and so on. And so we are in a good shape, <laughs> fortunately. So we can meet every uh, requirement regarding to the patient flow increase. A, a very specific question uh, in, in for the emergency patients in, in CAT lab. Did you have any specific change in the way you are dealing with them during this period? Well, you know, sometimes, and, and usually, uh, the patient with the chest pain, with angina, or with stroke, or another um, uh, emergency medical condition, they have fear, more or less. So our approach is, in general, multi-profile hospitals is to get the patient with the, uh, with the medical, uh, emergency medical condition with fever. This is urgent case. And as I said, we use PPE as suspect COVID patient uh, protocol uh, requires. So we 
make all this PP for personnel, for patient, and all, of course, we do all that PCI or urgent surgery or thrombolysis or thrombectomy, etc. So we do not reject patient with urgent uh, conditions. Okay. And uh, how do you feel that uh, the government um, was supportive to all what you have put in place? Do you think that uh, because uh, you, you are a leading players and the private sector is, is the dominant health service providers, you, you had more or less the lead in deciding how to implement the COVID directive? Uh, or did you, you had a, a on-site and technical support uh, from uh, government um, uh, officials or um, government agencies? Well, this is two-side cooperation between our corporation and uh, healthcare uh, officials. Uh, most of issues, most of problems, most of protocols or strategic steps are coordinated between us. So we are we are one of the one of the major uh, consultants or cooperative team to, for, to, to government. Uh, fortunately, we do not need any technical support because we have, as I said, all the equipment and all technical issues in the good shape and, and it, it's enough for us. As I said also, for COVID hospitals inside of our, uh, uh, inside of our um, corporation, government takes it, 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 its responsibility to cover all PP equipment for these hospitals. So this is support from, uh, from uh, healthcare uh, officials. And as I said, all strategic steps are coordinated between us. Sometimes we give some very important advices uh, and uh, they take it into consideration and we can see that our considerations, our experience or our point of view are um, uh, considered by government, by Ministry of Health and, and uh, we see our influence from good, uh, good point of view, I say, good influence from corporation to uh, state healthcare system and also very good influence from uh, healthcare system to our corporation. Okay, another question, a little technical, it's, you know, a part of infection control is the issue of uh, when you are creating specific areas for uh, COVID patients, uh, there might be the issue of the fact that this room may be positive pressure and uh, you would need to convert them into negative pressure. So does it mean that uh, for the create, uh, hosting the COVID patient, you had also to, to deal with the way the uh, pressure of the rooms were uh, handled and managed in the hospital? Yeah. The majority of our facilities has neg can, can switch from positive to negative pressure. Also operating rooms, we have dedicated operating rooms in case of getting a COVID suspect or COVID infected patient for urgent surgery. Uh, also we can, hello? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, also we, we can switch from positive to negative. Of course, it's not 100% of all isolated spaces, of course, talking honestly, but majority of our facilities has some some spaces that can be switched from positive to negative pressure. Okay, so the flexibility of the buildings and the, the way the ventilation of the buildings is, is a, an important element to face this kind of yes, situation yes. of uh, communicable disease. I agree. Okay, I think we've come to, to an end with the, the questions. So I will uh, just summarize some takeaway messages from your presentation and you are most welcome to, to complete, uh, to complete uh, these, these. So the first one, which I really uh, found very uh, interesting 
is that the very early important effort to develop protocols, but also to train the person, the staff. You imagine usually in emergency situation that people don't invest in capacity building and training. They just, you know, do the response often in a hectic way while you have in a systematic approach very early uh, organized even with a TOT, so that means a cascading training and the training of the personnel. So capacity building has not been against the need of emergency response. So that's a very uh, important message from, from your experience. The second one is uh, that you had also a very systematic and comprehensive role of the hospital, both for the education of the public but also for the staff and supporting very early the staff to monitor his, his own uh, uh, health. So that means he's uh, uh, systematically making the hospital a health promoting hospital, which is something that uh, we have been in IHF supporting and advocating in, in May for many years, uh, along with WHO, but for which uh, this uh, crisis is demonstrating well, you know, the, the role of hospital as a, a health promoting agent. The third one, which is the kind of usual one in many situations like that, is reducing the pressure of patients, the, the flow. But what you have done, to my understanding, is that while you have done that, you have not reduced the services. You have been able to uh, respond still to the services, especially with virtual services, uh, while avoiding to have too many patients. Uh, uh, that uh, would be overwhelming potentially the, the, the facilities. Uh, the other thing which I thought was uh, an interesting experience also is not only the emphasis on the uh, use of the protective uh, personal protective equipment, but the fact that you are also put in place a systematic monitoring process so that you could address any gaps or any um, dysfunctioning around the use of uh, PPE and on both sides, overuse and underuse. And last uh, but not least, uh, a very comprehensive contingency plans for uh, replacing uh, staff in case of uh, uh, being uh, incapacitated. So that's also um, an, an interesting uh, approach because it means that you are also uh, ahead of the curve with already having a, a, I would say, a B team in case the A team is not anymore in capacity to be uh, on, the, on the play field. Any other uh, takeaway message you would like to share with the participants before we close this uh, uh, webinar and my really my congratulations for all the great work you have done and uh, really appreciated your your uh, contribution yeah well what can i see at, uh, at the closure of our session is very important preventive aggressive preventive steps at the beginning uh, delegation of hospitals and monitoring and supporting them and giving recommendations uh, and give them independency to solve their own problems, but to support them, it's very important. And also monitoring, self-monitoring and active monitoring of personnel in, in the aim of uh, detect early detection of uh, signs of COVID infection to avoid the, the infection inside of the hospital in, among the uh, personnel. This is the this is the usual steps how to prevent because prevent preventable measures are more uh, effective than measures done immediately. Then problem is appear. You know, you agree? Thank you so much, Patricia. Please, uh, last uh, uh, informations, and uh, we'll conclude the, with the webinar. Yes, thank you, Eric. Uh, Professor Mamuka, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation and for sharing 
your experience. Um, we really learned a lot from this webinar. Uh, to everyone, we'll be posting the recording of this webinar on our website and you will, meet, you will be notified by email as soon as it's available. We're still organizing a number of webinars this May and in June. Um, the schedule is now on your screen and we'll post more information in the coming days. So you can go to www.ihf fih.org slash webinars to be updated and to register for these webinars. Um, we hope you can join us on the 15th of May. Uh, Dr. Els van der Wilden van Leer from GS1 will explain how GS1 standards can aid in the challenges of safety and efficiency of hospital supply chains. Safe supply chain and product identification are very important, especially within the situation we are currently in. So we hope to see you there. In the meantime, please stay safe and healthy. Together, we will overcome this global crisis. Thanks again for joining us today. Professor Momonka, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very Bye, much. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.